Welcome to Justin Zhao, who will be speaking to us about a language model council and looking at highly subjective tasks. Thank you. Thanks. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Justin Zhao, and I'm an independent researcher. And today we're going to talk about the Language Model Council, which is a democratic twist on LLM as a judge. Before we dive in, a quick note, I'm not a PhD student, nor do I have a PhD, but I have been a research engineer in the industry since 2015. And last year, I decided to take a sabbatical. And this is one of the projects I chose to pursue with the awesome small team shown here. I hope you enjoy our work. So language models are incredible, but they are outpacing our abilities to evaluate them. Lots of us are making all of these new benchmarks, but why are we doing this? Some people will say it's because we want to find something that correlates with intelligence, but crudely, I think our motivations are much simpler. We want to be able to say which LLM is the best because doing so demonstrates thought leadership. And this is why if you open up Twitter and Reddit, you are flooded with all these claims about which model is the new best. And personally, I got really tired of humans telling me which LLM is now the new best at X, Y, or Z. And so in this work, I desperately wanted to answer a bit of a different but simple question. Can we just get LLMs to decide amongst themselves who is the best? LLM Sys demonstrated that GPT-4 agrees with humans at roughly the same rate that humans agree with each other. And today, more and more of us are using models like GPT-4 in place of human raters. But GPT-4 is only one model. Today, it's actually one of the weaker models on Chatbot Arena. And how much does a model's chatbot arena score really tell us about its broad human alignment? The PRISM dataset, which was recognized as the best paper at NeurIPS in 2024, showed that these rankings shift very dramatically depending on which humans you actually sample. And so it turns out that for these open-ended subjective prompts, there's no single right answer. And different populations have fundamentally different views on what best means. On the other side of the coin, researchers have also found that LLMs exhibit all sorts of biases on gender, religion, and even value of life. More recent work from the Societal Impacts team at Anthropic and researchers at the Center at AI Safety are finding even more evidence that each model really does carry its own values. They're inherited unintentionally or intentionally from the societal societies and organizations that built them, and the humans that curate and choose their training data. In the future, you can imagine that we'll have strong LLMs from every country and many organizations, each shaped by different geopolitical priorities, specializations, and cultural values. And for things like advising on policies, being persuasive, predicting the future, a lot of these things may be too speculative or too subjective for any single model to evaluate fairly, and disagreement between AI systems will become more prevalent. So how do we make decisions amidst disagreeing, dissenting opinions in human society? Well, one thing we do in America is this thing called democracy. And to be clear, I'm not here to argue that democracy is working really well. We all know that it's far from perfect. But at its core, democracy is a profound idea. It's based on decentralizing power, giving everyone a voice, and relying on the collective to make important decisions. And that's the spirit behind the Language Model Council. We want to put LLMs in a democracy and give them some agency so that they can elect a leader amongst themselves. So how do we apply LLM democracy to something like building a leaderboard? To answer that, we need to zoom out and ask an even more basic question. What is a leaderboard, really? If you break down a leaderboard, there are really three key components. The first component is the test set. The test set encodes some notion of a competency that you care about. The second component is the respondents who participate in the tests. And the final piece is judging, where we define what good means, and we use that to rank the respondents. In the Language Model Council, the council oversees all these components of building the leaderboard. So how does this actually work? First, you want to select your council members. In our paper, we form a council of 20 LLMs from eight organizations in four countries with a mix of open and closed source models of varying sizes. Next, we get each member of the council to contribute some number of examples to form a test set. This is important because no one can complain that the test set was rigged. We combine all the examples together and shuffle them. And then with the test set finalized, everyone takes everyone's tests, including their own. For every test item, every LLM judges every LLM's response. So in our paper, we end up going with a arena setup where every judge gives pairwise ratings using a four-point scale and a single reference model with positional flipping, chain of thought prompting, and temperature zero. That was a lot of technical details, but the reasons for those choices are actually nuanced. And if you're curious, you should check out Appendix B in our paper. Once judging is done, we score everything up 
and using the same Bradley Terry setup as Chatbot Arena and using our pairwise comparisons, we now have a leaderboard. So to study this framework, we decided to focus on one of the most subjective things we could think of evaluating, which is emotional intelligence. The specific task is to respond to emotionally difficult dilemmas. For example, command R here proposes a hypothetical dilemma Two weeks ago, I had a huge fallout with my best friend. I said some things about her boyfriend, which I realized were unfair and uncalled for. And the test is then to respond to this dilemma. Claude says, it's clear that you deeply regret your actions, but you need to give your friend space. And GPT-40 says, I'm sorry, but here's what you should do. One, two, and three. So stylistically, you can start to see just how subjective this task is. Here's the final leaderboard, democratically decided by our council. Surprisingly, QN110B takes the top spot, beating GPT-40. So congratulations to Alibaba. The rest of the rankings look pretty expected with larger models ranking generally higher, but I think it's important to dive into some of the dynamics of how we got to these rankings. One of the first things you should do when you see an arena-style leaderboard is to look at the head-to-head -head win rates to see who exactly beat who. I know these heat, heat maps are a bit hard to read, so please bear with me. You can find the full resolution figures in the paper or on, on our website. Strong red or blue bands indicate consensus winners or losers. And individual cells tells, tell us, for example, that Claude Opus is expected to beat Llama 8B about 70% of the time. But ultimately, these win rates are determined by judges. And in the Language Model Council framework, every LLM is a judge. And so we can do this cross to build an agreement matrix. And this is cool because we can see, for example, that Gemini actually agrees with Mistral Large the most and with Quen 32 b the least. OpenAI and Mistral models have the strongest interfamily agreement. And on a council majority basis, Quen 110B is actually the most representative when it comes to aligning with a majority decision. Conversely, Llama 8B is the most contrarian LLM judge. Lastly, by putting the judges on one axis and respondents on the other, you get a view of affinity. This is the score a model receives when it's only judged by one other model. Overall, it looks like most council members generally, genuinely liked Quen 110B across the board. Command R is the least favorable. It's the most critical judge of Quen 110B, but it still gives it a positive win rate. But what's even more interesting is that we can actually subtract the council's final scores from all these individual judges' affinities to get a councilized view of affinities. Not only does this enable us to precisely measure self-enhancement bias by looking at the diagonal, but you can also see any and all disproportionate preference biases. For example, Mr. Large really, like, really dislikes Llama 38B, scoring at 23 points below the council's already low average. And conversely, Quen 32B disproportionately likes GPT 3.5. And the Llama family loves itself. The heat maps give us a lot of color and a lot to think about in terms of intermodal behavior and alignment. And personally, I find these to be some of the most interesting artifacts that come out from an LLM democracy. But coming back to the leaderboard, there's still a burning question that we want to answer. How do we know if our leaderboard is any good? So this is actually a very meta level question that I encourage all of us to think about, because so far, no one has a great answer beyond just vibes. And in our case, we're using LLMs for the entire evaluation process. So it's all vibes. And so we really need a more structured way to think about this question. And in our paper, we came up with four broad categories, human agreement, statistical significance, cost and efficiency, and robustness to cheating. Human agreement is probably the first thing that all of us think of when we think about rankings. Does the ranking match how people would judge these models? So we ran a human study with 102 participants and found that the council's rankings correlate more with humans than any individual judge or other benchmarks, including a EQ filtered subset of Chatbot Arena. For statistical significance, we look at separability and stability. There's a lot of math behind those words, but they're basically measures of the strength of your confidence intervals. And what we found is that the council is actually better at separating models than any, indivi than any individual judge, even across multiple aggregation methods. And then on cost and efficiency, a benchmark is, isn't useful if it's too slow or too expensive to run. And actually, this is a key question for the Language Model Council, which is, is it worth the overhead? Is democracy even worth it? More opinions means more compute, more energy, more money, and it's also more logistically complex to tally everyone's votes. So this naturally raises a critical question. What is the value of an additional opinion? What is the, what is the value of everyone's opinion? And then, you know, more fundamentally, what is the value of the incremental judge? 
To shed light on this question, we ran a Monte Carlo simulation with all these hypothetical council compositions and test sets of different sizes. And we find that the value of the incremental judge, it depends. When your test data is limited, adding more examples helps way more than adding more judges. And you can see this in the right chart where the gradient arrows point upward in the direction of incremental impact. But once your test set passes some number, then the gradient direction shifts and it's actually more valuable to add another judge. The, the statistical gains continue to go up, but once you have enough of both judges and test samples, you quickly hit these diminishing returns. More discriminately, I think it's also fair to ask how well a hand curated subset of judges can approximate the fully democratic results. And it turns out that a well-chosen sub-council can achieve similar outcomes on human agreement with only minor drops in separability. And this, is, I think, is a very interesting parallel to real democracies. Sometimes a smaller group of good representatives can legitimately reflect the will of the whole. With any leaderboard, you also have to ask, how easy is it to game? The council by, de by design is so hard to cheat on because it's just as decentralized as possible. But the spirit of democracy might falter on robustness in a different way. As your democracy grows, the less rigorous you can be about who you're including in the democracy. So in very large democracies like in America, it's reasonable to assume that some non-trivial number of people are either voting naively, randomly, or perhaps adversarially. And so it turns out that adding these bad faith judges to the council, these judges that vote totally randomly, it actually does hurt the leaderboard. But what's interesting is that the damage they do drops significantly as the size of your council increases, even when, you even when the proportion of the adversarial judges stays the same. So collecting more votes from more LLMs might be more expensive, but you, your evaluation becomes systemically more robust to bad participants. <laughs> to wrap up, I wanted to go back to our original question. Can LLMs decide amongst themselves who is the best? Our answer is yes, but there, is, there are definitely interesting trade-offs to consider regarding the value of your incremental judge. If you want to try out an LLM democracy for yourself, you can check out our library. You have to provide your own API keys, but you can get all the visualizations from this talk on any prompt of your choosing in just five lines of code. Finally, with agents becoming the next big thing, I think there will be a lot of different organizational structures emerging for how they self-organize and self-govern. And it's going to be interesting to see whether structures that don't work for humans will work for AI agents and vice versa. Democracy is only one such structure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I um, wrote a commentary in Nature about a paper that used an LLM to control the hallucinations of another LLM. And I used the metaphor of fighting fire with fire, which, you know, obviously sometimes that works very well. You control the fire, you put, out, put down a fire line, doesn't jump the line, and other times you don't, and you get a raging fire out of control. And I think the, the beauty of this idea is that you've got checks and balances in place a little bit. Yeah, that's right. Many fires. Many fires to control. Question. Can we put the mic on at the front? Here's this one. Okay. So thank you for your amazing talk. My question is, so um, you're testing these models on, so the models create their own tests and then evaluate each other. So how can you make sure that the test is actually measuring a model's performance or quality as we want to measure it and not like the instruction following abilities? So for example, we know that some of the models use generated outputs of another model in the training data. So how can you make sure that when they are evaluating the other model's responses, they're not just preferring like their output format or their style? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So uh, you, every model has its own preferences and its own biases. I think, you know, that's been established. But I think like, for example, if you go back to the heat maps, you can start to see like where this is too far back. I can't go back. But yeah, I think like it's reasonable to assume like humans, like we all have our kind of irrational preferences. And so part of the beauty of the system is that you can, if you make your democracy large enough, that all of these biases kind of get mitigated as you aggregate everything up. I was just wondering, and this is great, by the way, thank you for this talk. I was wondering, have you tried fine tuning a model on the aggregate decisions of all the models? Yeah, good question. That's not something I've tried, but absolutely. I think when you find consensus, you can, 
you can potentially distill that into a separate system. And then, for example, like Quen 110B was the most representative of the majority opinion, but you can definitely train a model to specialize on being a representative and potentially use that to represent, you know, 100 LLMs. Let, let's thank our speaker one more time.